Uh, I want to talk about several things that I was very fortunate to, to be involved in. Um, the, the first group uh, that I'm actually going to cover more extensively is the Suicide Club, which is a group that I joined when I, I fell into when I was an 18-year-old juvenile delinquent. And uh, that group had, it was an underground group. Um, it wasn't very well known at the time because we didn't publicize it. And uh, it, uh, had, it seems to have had a great resonance over the years in uh, different weird art events that have come out of the United States, some of them quite well known now. Um, so I'm going to cover that more than the later uh, it, it organizations that you might be, might be familiar with. Um, so first I'm going to show uh, a short video to kind of open things up. The Cacophony Society. 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 Not at all true. Uh, we're going to visit the sewers of Oakland. Now, some people might say that that's a redundant statement. From a, a gourmet point of view, this is a choice sewer. Defined as the quote, the act of throwing something or someone out of the window. The street features a piano, two dozen pieces of furniture, and household appliances being defenestrated <laughs> from a four story building. These pieces of furniture that have taken it upon themselves to rid themselves of the slavery of their human captors. And we'll be handing out uh, body parts to various folks. Are you going to eat this animal? Perhaps later if we run out of other things. Biggest game on the North American continent, an Oldsmobile. Uh, we'll be moving on to the next century, primordialism, primitivism coming back and all that, so be ready for it. I hope you enjoyed that.
You guys aren't bad people. So that's a compilation of a, a very small uh, single, singling out of uh, events that took place over the course of over 30 years in several different groups that uh, I'm fortunate to be involved in. There are many, many people involved in these groups, Cacophony Society and the Suicide Club were uh, confederations, I would call them, not collectives so much as confederations, um, and a lot of creative people involved. Okay, so uh, this is a book that we produced a couple of years ago called Tales of the San Francisco Cacophony Society. I, they're, they're big books. There's one over here. If you get a chance, you might be take a look at it. If you want to get a copy of it, you can order it online from the publisher. Um, if not, no, no problem. Um, the Suicide Club was uh, inspired by many, many things. Um, the primary thing was a story, uh, an, an, an adventure story from uh, the Victorian era called The Suicide Club. It was written by Robert, Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, who wrote a, a number of really amazing uh, 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 adventure stories and uh, it was very inspirational to many people, <laughs> children and adults alike. The Suicide Club was about a group of men who put their worldly affairs in order to live each day as though it were their last. In other words, you know, you never know when you're gonna die, so if there's something that you haven't done that you wanna try to do, you should probably do it because you never know how long you're going to be here for. Um, the Suicide Club was uh, open format. It was a, an anarchist uh, type situation in that anyone who is a member of the anyone who's a member of the group could create an event. The event was uh, disseminated in uh, a newsletter, and uh, anyone could do the event. And if you didn't like the event, you could come back and recreate the event yourself. Um, anyone can do the events whatsoever. On an individual event, however, uh, the organizers of the event could be as completely controlling as they wished and you had to agree to their rules for that specific event. But then you could come back and do the event again in your own fashion if you didn't like their rules. And uh, the editorship of the newsletter um, rotated every month. Everyone was expected to or encouraged to be the editor at least once. So uh, sometimes the newsletters were very well constructed, other times they were barely legible, you could hardly read them. Um, like I say, climbing bridges and sneaking into abandoned buildings was a big part of, uh, a big part of what we did, urban exploration. We didn't uh, use the term until the later part of the Suicide Club, and the first time I heard the term urban exploration was from Gary Warren, who was the, uh, one of the founders of the Suicide Club. Um, this is the Bay Bridge. We didn't take a lot of photographs of events that we did because the, the idea, the philosophy of the group was that uh, if you were taking photographs, you weren't participating fully. So there are some photos, but for a five-year history, you know, which uh, you know, is as long as the group lasted, there really aren't that many, but there are a few. Um, these are just some shots taken of, the, of bri different bridge climbs that we were on. Um, this is the underside, of the underside of the Golden Gate Bridge. And we would do group climbs. We uh, the largest group of people I took up the uh, Golden Gate Bridge was 16 people which was really stupid because that's way too many people. Um, the Suicide Club was an amateur group. We didn't have any idea what we were doing. <laughs> we, would, we would try anything, and that was the magic of the group. We would do stuff that we didn't know how to do. Um, we didn't know how to climb things when we started. We just went out and explored and tried to figure out how to do it. Took a few photos. This is one of the few group photos taken in the early days up on the bridge. Uh, the fellow in the little white hat up in the upper left-hand corner is uh, John Gilmore. Uh, who was uh, one of the folks who founded the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which I don't know if you know that group or not, but they're an American society, well-funded, that fights the government on uh, encryption issues. And he uh, has been doing that for some time. But he was in the Suicide Club. Um, you know, climbing bridges was very frightening to a lot of people in the group because they weren't climbers. But bridges were made to climb for workers, so there are ladders on them. So if you know that, um, then, uh, you know, you can, you can take people who are not necessarily climbers up on, up on the bridges. Getting naked on a cable car, to, to me climbing wasn't frightening because I was a good climber. Getting naked in public was very frightening to me because I was raised middle class and you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> the, so this was the most, this was probably the most uh, liberating event that I personally did in the Suicide Club was getting naked on a cable car, believe it or not. Many other people in the group could care less, they were getting a naked in public, whatever, at San Francisco, doesn't everybody do that? But for me, this was a groundbreaking experience <laughs> when I was a 19-year-old kid to, to do something like this on a cable car in the middle of San Francisco during the day. Um, we would do uh, street theater events. This was a thing called Decoy Street, where uh, uh, one friend of ours, Steve Mobile, was walking down a very tough neighborhood, saw a man lying on the ground bleeding and tried to help him, realized 
that his wounds were fake wounds. And as he was trying to help the man, a giant black prostitute walked over, flashed a badge at him and said, get the fuck out of here, we're police. It was a sting operation to capture criminals. So when he saw that, he was so uh, amazed by that, he created an event based on it called Decoy Street, where we all got dressed up as decoys and went around in the same tough block neighborhood that the police were working in. And we would, and we had, I don't have any good pictures of this, but we had wads of fake money in our pockets. And then every once in a while, two or three of the decoys would jump on another person and beat them up and take their money. And then another decoy would jump up and arrest them. So it was a street theater piece that we did on the street in a pretty tough neighborhood. And by the time we'd been doing it for a couple of hours, the women in the, in the massage parlors had come out of the buildings to watch us. The uh, undercover police were standing at the edge of the, of the street corner watching us. They couldn't figure out what the fuck we were doing. <laughs> Um, uh, we did uh, gangster uh, and detective games, which is a big thing in the States. Uh, Dashiell Hammett was a huge influence on the, uh, on the Suicide Club. This is a reenaction, uh, this is actually a reenactment, but this was a, a game that we played, a two-day street game that we played on the street. Now, a lot of the Suicide Club was about challenging your fears, one, and about playing, about adults playing, which was kind of a radical idea a bit in the 70s. Um, and uh, the idea was that if you have the ability to actually play with other people. It's an, it's an important component of, of any good, healthy life, is to play. We, we didn't do many public events. Uh, the very few that we did, one was a movie showing that we did at the Roxy Cinema called A Tribute to Paranoia. And we showed two films that were <laughs> had wonderful paranoid themes. Uh, but that was one of the only public events that we did. Uh, most of what we did was for ourselves. Um, th this was an event, this was a 10-year ten, ten anniversary of the Summer of Love in San Francisco. This was 1977, 10 years after the 67 <laughs> media event, uh, the hippie uh, uh, Summer of Love, which actually was the end of the hippie scene, really, if you study the history. And, uh, and so we, um, um, we got dressed up like hippies and went down to the hate and got together with all of the other folks who wanted to be hippies but missed the party by about 10 years. <laughs> And uh, we went around, and we actually ran into, by total coincidence, ran into a photographer from High Times Magazine who thought we were real hippies and took a picture of us and put it in uh, High Times Magazine. Um, we would do other pranks, uh, like we went to pick up a friend coming into the airport with a bunch of people dressed up in stupid costumes. And uh, Gary Warren, dressed up as the Invisible Man, leapt out of the chair and grabbed her as she came off of the, uh, off of the ramp from the plane. Because back then you could do pranks in airports and not be beaten. Um, food fights were big. Um, our friend Pierre was uh, being thrown out of his house that he had rented for many years by uh, a, an unpleasant landlord. So he thought, well, I'll have all my friends over. We'll have a giant food fight in the house before I leave. So that's what we did. Um, uh, and uh, pie fights were really big in the Suicide Club. Um, uh, there's a group, um, the Suicide Club did a billboard alteration in 1977. This was one of the billboards that we changed. Uh, it was kind of a sexist billboard. It said, warning and pretty face isn't safe in the city. Fight back with uh, self-defense, the new moisturizer by Max Factor. So we changed it to say this, which I thought was a more relevant advertising uh, um, you know, thing to say. And I was very inspired by this. I was 19 when we did this, and I was inspired by this. And So me and uh, David T. Warren, who's uh, one of the main organizers of the Suicide Club, we decided to uh, start another group later, which I'll get into a little bit later, called the Billboard Liberation Front. Um, people, in the, see, see, people in the Suicide Club were encouraged to do events. Now, many people didn't feel competent to do an event, but the thing that was brilliant about the Suicide Club is you didn't need to have competency. You just needed the will to do uh, an event and a bunch of other people who were stupid enough to help you do it, and that's what the Suicide Club was. It was a delivery system for people to, to create fantasies. Our friend Carla Wood was a stripper had been a stripper professionally for many years. And she always, uh, she thought, well, I don't know how to do an event. You climb bridges and go in sewers and do that sort of thing. I don't know how to do that. But, but I really like, I want to do a burlesque show for real people, not for creepy guys with hats on their laps. I want to do a burlesque show for people that I like. And she knew of this building, the Follies Theater, which she had performed in when she was a young, younger lady. And she, it was abandoned, and so she asked a couple of fellows in the Suicide Club, she said, could you think we could sneak into this building and maybe do an event in there? And so we helped her occupy the building, this abandoned theater, found an electrical panel, 
uh, and created a situation where she could have her friends come in and do a giant burlesque show with lighting and, and jugglers and strippers for a hundred people in an audience that were her friends and people in the suicide club that we snuck into the building. So it was a very liberating thing for her to realize she could just occupy a space and create something that she considered to be very important, an uh, art for her, and do a really wonderful burlesque show for people. So she did that. Um, there were other things, uh, other events that uh, the Suicide Club was involved in. It basically encouraged everyone to do an event, encouraged people to do an event based on their, their desires. Um, some things we don't talk about that we were involved in back then. It was the 70s. <laughs> uh, and everything you've heard about the 70s were true if you're a younger person. Um, so this is, uh, I'm gonna talk, talk about some of the things that influenced the Suicide Club because there were a lot of influences for it. Now when I joined the club, I was 18 years old and I had no history, I knew very little. I was basically a, a, a walking id, I would do anything. I wanted to have experiences. And so most of the people in the club were maybe five to 10 years older than me. And, uh, but it was a format where I could create events and I learned how to do that very early. I was a climber and explorer, so I was encouraged to do that sort of thing. But I didn't realize for many years, that when, I, when I came to San Francisco, okay, I showed up there in 1976. I was 17 years old, I hitchhiked there and I uh, slept in Golden Gate Park with a sleeping bag and panhandled on Market Street, and I was ready for the party because San Francisco is where the party was. That's what I knew, that's what I had been told by the media. And so I show up there, and where are the hippies? Where's everything? I go to Haight Street. You've heard of Haight Street, maybe? It's a the big hippie party street in San Francisco. I go there, and I'm like, woohoo, where's the party? Let's go, where's the party? And they're all these like, really old hippies, and you know they're kind of drug addicts, and they're sort of really kind of bums. And they all tell me, the party's over, kid. You missed it. <laughs> it was 10 years ago. You should go back to Tennessee, because it's over. And I thought, well, fuck that. You know, I mean, w within a year, the punk scene started in San Francisco and other cities. Within a year, I stumbled into the Suicide Club, mostly by chance. So, you know, now I'm like an older guy. You know, I've been around a little bit. Kids, they ask me. How, oh, it must have been great back in the day, you know, starting Burning Man, doing all this fun stuff back in the day. And I just say, you know, yeah, back in the day was great. It was a lot of fun, but you know what? Fuck that. You know, you're a kid. Do something. Now's the time. You're alive right now. And there are all kinds of things happening, all kinds of underground activities happening all over the world. You just have to find them. If you can't find them, you should make them. So uh, this back in the day thing, I'm not, uh, I'm not a fan of that philosophy. Living, I don't live in the past. I like to show the past so that people can get ideas from it to do something in the, in the present and the future. Um, Joshua Norton was a, a businessman in San Francisco in the 1850s and 60s. He made a pile of money, then he lost all of his money, and he went insane. And he was very well known locally, very well known the character. And he came back after disappearing for a couple of years and declared that he was the uh, emperor of the United States and the protector of Mexico. And for the next 20 years, he drank for free and ate for free all over San Francisco. He was probably the most famous person in the city. And he would make declarations like, uh, oh, and he would do things like uh, there was a, a riot going on where people were, uh, were attacking some Chinese immigrants. And he, st he was such a well-known character. He stood in between the people who were trying to, trying to kick the immigrants out of their shanty town. And he declared that they, that they were to be allowed to stay there. <laughs> this crazy man dressed up like an emperor. And he was such a well-known character that he actually backed the mob down. So uh, he was a great hero of the Suicide Club. Um, this is a page from our book. Uh, my co-author, Kevin Evans, uh, did these wonderful factoids <laughs> where he would uh, give a, a colorful description of important uh, moments uh, in the Suicide Club in, character, uh, in Cacophony. Uh, Alfred Jari, you may have heard of. Um, I, th I think he was probably an American, but uh, he was a character who, uh, uh, you know, pre precursor to the, uh, to the um, uh, art groups in, in France that uh, then had a profound influence on uh, the future of art history and, and pranking too, because uh, Jari is a, a great hero to, uh, to many different underground groups over the decades, including the Suicide Club. Um, 
he uh, pioneered the science of pataphysics, declared that he could reconstitute uh, uh, his neighbor's annoying children if he were to shoot them to death. He would just reconstitute them by means of pataphysics. You know, it was never tested, so who really knows if it would have worked. But uh, um, Lon Chaney Sr., one of the great, great silent actors, had a huge, uh, profound effect on the Suicide Club and our, our ideas and philosophies. Uh, film, literature, uh, stories, and mythology, all of these avenues for uh, communication were used by members of the Suicide Club to create real events in, in the world. Uh, gaming, uh, the new games book, the new games concept, which is not well known now, but was fair, very well known in the 1970s, came out of a, it was inspired by the Whole Earth uh, uh, catalog, which Stuart Brand put together. And New Games was a collection of uh, very idealistic young people who went around the world and collected games from different tribal cultures and then put them in this book and would do festivals and encourage people to play these different types of games, most of which were cooperative games. Um, uh, new, uh, new Games was best known for the Earth Ball, which is a giant ball filled with air. You can't really see, the photos are terrible, but that ball has the Earth painted on it. Okay, so this is kind of a, one of the cool hippie things, you know, I mean, I'm not entirely, you know, done with the hippies, they have some good ideas. But, uh, you know, uh, there are other things, this is a, one, one aspect of this, uh, of this uh, uh, entire um, um, festival presentation that we're doing here is a, a, the business uh, 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 in conjunction with, uh, you know, disruption and pranking and that sort of thing. So, and I look back through uh, my records and remembered many things, like one, uh, one of the things that influenced the Suicide Club was a group called the Briar Patch, that was a, a hippie business group that was based on cooperative uh, effort from small businesses. And it was started by a man named Michael Phillips, who was one of the uh, main influences behind Stuart Brand and behind the uh, uh, Whole Earth Catalog and, and, and behind a lot of Brand's early work. And Michael put together with so many other people this group called the Briar Patch, and there were uh, close to 100 businesses, small businesses involved in it at one time. And they encouraged barter between businesses and that kind of thing. Gary Warren, who was the uh, prim primary avatar of the Suicide Club, was a small business owner. He had a bookstore uh, and a cafe at one time. He was a terrible businessman, <laughs> but he was, a, he was a great prankster. But he did support himself with these small businesses. He was a member of the Briar Patch, and he wrote some pieces for this book, uh, the compilation book that they made. Uh, other influences, uh, you know, on Cacophony and Suicide Club, of course, you know, uh, the Surrealist and Dadaist had a, a big influence on Gary Warren and, uh, the, and, and some of the er early organizers of the club. This is a page from our, from our book, um, kind of commemorating that influence. Um, and of course, this cast of criminals here, um, which I had never heard of when I was 18, but, you know, read about over the years and was inspired by some. Um, another big influence from the hippies uh, was, uh, th were the diggers, whose idea was that everything should be free and that your personal life should be lived as though you were, the, you were the lead character in your own movie. You should live your life as an adventure. And this was a big influence, uh, I think a subtle one, but a big influence on, on stuff that we became involved in. Uh, of course, the diggers. Uh, there's an art group called uh, Ant, Ant Farm, which if you've studied American art history, they're, they're pretty popular, or popular is the wrong word, they're an influential group. Um, they were financed, uh, lucky for them, by a, an eccentric Texas oil millionaire named Stanley Marsh III, and they did many <clears throat> bizarre art installations, including Cadillac Ranch, which is still there, this is what it looks like now. 10 Cadillacs, buried, uh, you know, halfway buried <clears throat> in a kind of a car hinge configuration. Uh, they did Media Burn, which had a big influence on Cacophony later. Um, Gary Warren was, uh, uh, was, a, uh, was at this event and watched it, and there's a movie made about the Media Burn, and after they drive the Cadillac through the wall of burning television sets, they allowed the audience to come in and smash the television sets with sledgehammers which I'm sure many people enjoyed, and it, as I said, it had an influence on us later. Here's Gary uh, at his bookstore, Circus of the Soul, Circus of the Soul Books. Um, Gary passed away at uh, the tender age of 35. Uh, he had a heart attack. Uh, he was not an unhealthy person, but he had a blood disease, and he had a heart attack at 35. After creating more 
different types of events and having an enormous influence on a small group of people uh, that resonates to this day in California and the United States and also I believe in the world. Um, without the Suicide Club, these later groups would not exist and we'll talk a little bit about them in a while. Uh, Gary Partner, Gary was a very con controlled fellow. He had a very set idea. He, he was the first person I ever met whose entire day was broken down into 15 minute increments and he had to make an appointment. Even his best friends and his lovers had to make appointments with him. He was so fucking busy, and we're all busy, right? This guy, he must have known he was gonna croak because he, ne he didn't waste a second. He didn't waste a second in his life. So, uh, passed away at 35, very devastating to me and to his other friends. His, he partnered with a fellow named David T. Warren uh, different people that are not related, different last names that sound the same. David Warren was the spirit of chaos in the Suicide Club. Gary was uh, kind of the, uh, you know, the uh, super ego, and David was the it. David would do anything. I remember he was a hardcore alcoholic. He would not drink for long periods of time, and he would do, be very creative, and then he would fall off the wagon and do incredibly stupid and dangerous things while drunk. But when he wasn't drunk, he was one of the most brilliant and creative people I've ever known in my life. He, before he joined the Suicide Club, before he and Gary started the Suicide Club, he did several different pranks. Uh, he would go down to Union Square, which is the big square in San Francisco, and put out a ladder. He, he would basically dare people to do things against superstition, like walk under a ladder, uh, smash mirrors on the ground. He had a whole bunch of mirrors. He would also go down to Union Square at Christmas time and dress up as a Salvation Army fellow. I don't know if you know Salvation Army, but those are the people who collect money for, for poverty. They have, wear the red suits, and they have a big cauldron filled that you put money in. He would go down there with a the cauldron filled with money, with a bell, ringing the bell, and a sign that said, free money, take some. <laughs> so that was David. Um, he was, a, at the time, in the late 70s, to my understanding, he was the only fire eater in San Francisco. I don't know of any others, there may have been one or two, but he was the only fire eater in San Francisco. Now, after 20 years of Burning Man, everybody and their grandmother eats fire in San Francisco. Uh, these are the, Commune University was the free school that the Suicide Club grew out of, that Gary uh, and David were involved in. It, uh, it was a, the, the idea was, uh, it was a free school, anyone could create classes, anyone could come to the class. It started, as an adjunct of San Francisco State University. It was part of the free school movement in America in the late 60s, which was a, something that happened in many major universities across the country. I think in part, it was because the administrations were looking for some way to appease the student uprisings at the time, and they thought, well, we'll help them administer a free school. It'll be free, maybe they'll like that. So uh, Gary was an administrator for Community University when it was at SF State. Of course, he did weirder and weirder, allowed weirder and weirder classes, and eventually got into uh, disagreement with the, the uh, administration at SF State. So he took Kim University and they made it into a nonprofit corporation and ran it for several years, and it's the group that the Suicide Club came out of. Um, we would raise money for Kim University by doing garage sales. People would, all the people who were involved in Kim University would, uh, would donate their stuff and then we would sell it in a big garage sale, and you could pay whatever you wanted for the stuff. There was no price. You paid what you wanted. So what would happen is one asshole would come in and take a new stereo and give you one dollar for it, but for every asshole that gave you a dollar for one stereo, and we were like, fine, here, it's your stereo, we take the dollar. For every asshole who took the one dollar, uh, you know, uh, gave us one dollar, 50 people would come in and give us two or three dollars for us for a pair of socks or for something that had no value. So we would raise $700 three, three times a year, which was enough money to print the catalog of classes for community university. So the idea was for things to be free, and for people to participate in that fashion. Um, our, our motto was uh, from, uh, 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 well, there were several mottos, and see if I can remember it. Um, was H.L. Uh, uh, Mencken stated at one time, uh, the American humorist and critic, stated that uh, guilt is a terrible thing. And we, that was the sign that we had in front of the garage sale. So uh, <laughs> uh, Gary Warren had many projects uh, on the tables before he died. Another one was the Gorilla Grotto, which was a storefront, storefront classroom 
where uh, this is in the back. He built a giant playpen where we have the discussion groups and then pillow fights. Pillow fights were really big, as were pie fights. As I say, playing was an integral part of all of this stuff that we were involved in. This is the staff of the Gorilla Grotto. It's a terrible photo. It's a bad copy of the photo, but it's the best that I had. Um, here's the co some copies of the newsletters. Um, they were printed on paper that we got out of dumpsters, garbage paper, uh, and then we print the newsletters on the back of these uh, and then distribute them by mail to people in the group. Um, here's another one. Uh, our friend, the artist Don Heron, made an actual logo for us and started calling the newsletter the noose letter <laughs> since it was the suicide club, right? Nobody actually killed themselves, okay? That was uh, merely the name of the group. Uh, David Warren was, a uh, you know, uh, before joining the Suicide Club or before starting the Suicide Club, he was a character. He was a, a well-known local prankster and, uh, you know, just had, had fun. Here he is with his two young sons giving money away. Uh, there were some other people. Uh, Jason Wechter pied Charles Colson in the face at the Fairmont Hotel. Charles Colson was Richard Nixon's chief of staff. Okay, that was a, a, a related event. So there were other people involved in the Suicide Club that were funny and had ideas. The Billboard Liberation Front, when we started it, I was 19 years old when we started the group. We did, uh, uh, Jason, who was our, uh, who was our uh, 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 press agent, and I didn't even know what a press release was, he said, we should make a press release. And I'm like, what's a press release? And he goes, well, it's so you type out something and you give it to the newspaper. And I'm like, oh, that sounds great. So we typed them out and we, ha we hand delivered them to the newspapers after doing this billboard that we had done. We did six of those billboards all around town. And within two days, the image that we created was in newspapers in Europe and all across the world. And I'm an 18 year old juvenile and 19 year old juvenile delinquent and it was like I'd been hit by a brick or something. I believe it, that was the first time I understood the power of using the press for something. And this is ancient history now, this is newspapers and paper press releases, but some things don't change. And the press will print what you want them to if you give them what they want. And that's something I learned when I was very young. Um, other influences on the Suicide Club were uh, movies and Pulp Fiction. Um, Harold Maude was a, there, there are many different people in the group. I mean, I liked climbing and exploring. Other people were interested in more in street theater. Uh, so we also did, we, uh, we, were, we, were, we did uh, things like we would infiltrate strange cults and that sort of thing. So, um, uh, books that were influential, uh, pulp writers, and uh, The Dice Man, which is a wonderful book, if you can find it, I highly recommend it. It's about a man who makes every choice in his life by throwing the dice. He gives himself options, and he throws the dice, and he does whatever the dice say. Uh, pulp Fiction, once again, Haggard, and uh, the, the, you know, the Victorian and later era adventure writers, movies, big influence, we would do events based on movies. Sometimes we would show movies, 16 millimeter films. We had a projector and we had a friend who worked at a rental agency that rented films to theaters, so we would get them for free and we would show a movie and then we would go do an event based on the movie. So uh, once again, you know, this confluence, uh, almost a synesthesia of fiction in real life was a big part of what we were trying to do. Dashiell Hammett, huge influence. He was the hard boy. He basically created initially the hard boiled detective school of writing, which is uh, very influential in the States. Also influential on French film and many other things. Uh, Th Third Man was a wonderful movie that we very, really enjoyed. We showed this movie one time in the 16 millimeter print, and then we went into real sewers to explore them. We showed this Texas Chainsaw Massacre one time and then went and slept in a cemetery with about 25 people after seeing the movie. Uh, the Suicide Club ended in 1983. Uh, Gary died uh, in, in, in 83. Suicide Club ended around the same time. And then we were fallow for a while. Um, and then we decided we wanted to start an, another group that was similar to the Suicide Club. So uh, a bunch of people got together uh, Gene Mashovsky, Lance Alexander, Louise Darmilowitz, and started the Cacophony Society based on the uh, old tenets of the Suicide Club. Cacophony was similar to the Suicide Club, but was a more open group. The Suicide Club was a, a secret society. We didn't advertise what we were doing. There are very few articles written about it. 
some of the articles that were written, the journalists had no idea that they were writing about the Suicide Club. There were a couple that were written that they didn't know what the group was. Um, but Cacophony was much more open. We didn't care um, as much about media. And so they could come on the event as long as they were part of the event. Um, one event that a friend started uh, was the Salmon Run. There's a giant race in San Francisco every year called Beta Breakers where 100,000 people race. So Cacophony uh, got together and made <laughs> salmon costumes uh, and would run against the tide. <laughs> there's some symbolism in there somewhere, I'm not really sure what. Um, we did an annual event called the Golden Gate Bridge Dinner where we would show up in costume, usually uh, in some, some type of formal dress, and we would have a giant potluck dinner on the pedestrian walkway of the Golden Gate Bridge. And we would you know, have sword battles, that kind of thing. Um, and typically what would happen is we would be out there for about maybe an hour, and then the police would realize that traffic was stopping on the bridge because there was a sword battle happening on the sidewalk and there were 100 people in formal dress. And they would send out a motorcycle officer, and it became a ritual because we did this event for 25 years every year until they finally wouldn't let us do it anymore because there were too many people. The police would come out and they would go, okay, you know you have to stop and leave. We're like, oh yeah, we'll start picking up, don't worry officer. And then, you know, we started very slowly picking up and within about an hour and a half we would leave. So that was a yearly ritual. So here we are on the Golden Gate Bridge, hanging out at the Suicide Club, uh, late, actually this is early cacophony. Um, then uh, we did a lot of exploration, sewers, sewer exploration tunnels. Uh, we did a twist. After the first sewer walk that we did in 1977, we would do them uh, every once in a while. We started doing them in formal dress, and then we would have a potluck dinner at the end of the at the end of the walk. So here we are coming out of a underground tunnel after being underground for about two hours. Uh, there's another another shot in formal dress from the waist up, hip waders from the waist down, that kind of thing. And of course. Uh, once again, bridge climbing, we were big on that. Um, and uh, urban, urban, urban exploration was a, was a big thing. And the, the tenets of the Suicide Club actually uh, you know, resonated with, with a lot of uh, later groups. One of them was to, uh, to not damage your environment in any fashion. And uh, we would, uh, so, so by not damaging your environment, uh, that meant if you went into an abandoned space, not even leaving garbage in the abandoned space, we would take our own garbage out. If we climbed the bridge, we left nothing, we didn't tag it, we never tagged things. The Billboard Liberation Front was a different group that was specifically to alter advertisements. We didn't do tagging, we didn't trash or damage spaces. We climbed and explored many interesting places. Uh, and like I say, most, in, most anyone in this audience could climb up to the top of that bridge. You may not think so, but uh, anyway. Um, other events that we were involved in, uh, the meat parade, this was in, in Berkeley in the middle of a, a large scale public parade that we were invited to be in. And so we did a contingent called PETA, P-E-T-A, People Eating Them Animals. And we cooked, uh, actually we burned meat. Uh, uh, we had pig's heads and uh, we were throwing out cigarettes to the crowd, um, saying, here kid, first cigarettes for free. And because it's Berkeley, California, of course, we had our counter protesters, the, the vegetarians, <laughs> who would shout slogans at us like, uh, I pity your tragic colon. Don't laugh at the meat people. There's nothing funny about meat. <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, we did costumed events, some of them quite elaborate. Um, it, it, does anyone out there know Food Not Bombs? It's a group that they, they feed poor people and they're very radical group, they insist on feeding whether the local uh, local groups will let them or not. Uh, our friend Peter Doty did an event called Let Them Eat Cake, where we prepared very beautiful cakes, which we would follow and deliver to the homeless people after Food Not Bombs had fed them their dinner. And they'd have these wonderful cakes delivered to them by French aristocracy. And when we were done with the event, we had a giant silver tray, which had the crumbs from the, uh, from the uh, earlier event, which we delivered to the mayor's office, which was across the street. So we delivered them, uh, uh, anyway, uh, Billboard Liberation Front, uh, we'll, I, I'm kind of winding down over time. Uh, we did different billboards. Um, we considered what we were doing to be, uh, we were helping the advertisers. 
You know, we, we felt that their ad writers, their copywriters were deficient, so we would change the ad copy to a better, uh, more effective advertising copy, and then we would go put it up. No one understood this particular billboard, <laughs> except for maybe one or two philosophy professors, and they probably crashed their car when they drove by it. <laughs> uh, Apple Computer, everybody loves Apple. What a wonderful company. You know, I have an Apple Computer here. When we did the Apple campaign, we were ass assaulted on, on the web by Apple uh, cultists who were, who were saying things like, why are you attacking Apple? We're the good guys. What are you, shills for Microsoft? Are you working for Microsoft? <laughs> you know, I don't know what to say about that. Um, Exxon Corporation, um, they had a giant oil spill in Alaska back in 1989, and we felt that we should help them out with their advertising campaign. And uh, as noted by uh, an Exxon spokesperson, oil leakage is a natural occurrence. <laughs> Ron English is a good friend of ours. He was a billboard alterer, uh, an artist from uh, Texas and then later from New York. I'm going to go through this really quickly. Um, so we worked with him on several, uh, uh, several hits. This is one that he and I conceived of. Ronald McDonald's 50th anniversary. 50 years. And the idea was that aliens came to, uh, the, came to Earth 50 years ago and started McDonald's so that over a period of time it would become a, a physical meme which spread all over the planet. Everyone would eat McDonald's. It would change their body chemistry so that they would be edible for the aliens when they came back. <laughs> this is the only animatronic billboard alteration that I know of in history. The Ronald McDonald figure moved his hand, had a hamburger on it, which he was shoving into the fat kid's face. Uh, we had a bunch of Ronald McDonald's and Hamburglers on the scene. Uh, then we went to the McDonald's store across the street where all of us couldn't get enough money between 30 clowns to pay for one package of potatoes. And they threw us out. And of course, it's not a party until the police come. We've covered that already. So this was a big party. Um, there they are. They didn't know who had altered the billboard, but they had to arrest somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so they did. They arrested Ronald McDonald on his 50th birthday. <laughs> SantaCon. Uh, sorry about SantaCon. It uh, <laughs> used to be a lot of fun. It's a pretty big, stupid event now, like other things. Um, this was started in 1994 as a Cacophony Society event in San Francisco, and it became what I'd like to consider one of the first uh, internet memes, because as we were doing these events, Burning Man and Cacophony were, were rising up uh, at the same time as the internet culture was being, being created. So a lot of these things just took off. We had no intention at the outset of creating a, 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 an event that would go around the world and that tens of thousands of people would do, but that's what happened. And uh, same thing with Burning Man. Burning Man became the, uh, uh, it became the uh, uh, vacation of choice for the uh, internet crowd. Um, but when it started out, it was a much more radical event. Bad Santa again. Um, it's not, a, you know, like you say, until the cops come. The blues and the reds. Uh, Chuck Palahniuk wrote the book Fight Club. Um, I met him in 1996. He was a member of Portland Cacophony Society. And he based... Project Mayhem, which is the group in his novel, The Fight, uh, Fight Club, on the Cacophony Society. And uh, so this is, a, this is a scene from the movie Fight Club. Very short scene, but I like it. I don't know why. Those are, those are Visa and bank buildings that were blowing up. Uh, Ch Chuck Palahniuk wrote this stuff based on other things, but also on his experiences in the Cacophony Society. Um, Zone Trip was a thing conceived of by my co-author, Kerry Galbraith, in 1988. And the idea it was based on the writings of uh, the, the, the um, Strugowski brothers and the movies of, uh, of uh, Andrei Tark Tarkovsky, particularly Stalker. And uh, her idea was that we would enter the zone, which is a, a place that uh, the Strugowski brothers described in their books, where you don't know what's going to happen. Reality is bent. Gravity doesn't work. Think, you just don't know anything could happen. Not necessarily a good thing either. Um, so these are some stills from, from the zone. 
from that movie. And she based her concept on, on these writings and movies. The first zone trip that the Cacophony Society did was to Los Angeles, which is an odd place, and we looked at it as through the eyes of surreal tourists. The second zone trip we did was to Los Angeles. The third one was the first Burning Man in the Black Rock Desert. That was the third, it was the uh, uh, San Francisco Cacophony Society uh, zone trip number four. We, we called it number four because the first zone trip didn't actually happen. But anyway, Temporary Autonomous Zone was a theory uh, that we ran across in about 91, 92, written by a fellow named Hakeem Bey. And we realized that we were, with Burning Man, we were basically doing what this guy was writing about, creating a temporary zone and doing whatever we wanted to in a free anarchist method and leaving before the authorities could figure out what the fuck had happened. That's what Burning Man was when we started it. Um, it was a it was a free event. It was a bit pretty much. We didn't call it this, but it was basically an anarchist event where there were, were no rules. People were expected to be good and to not be assholes. And in the most for the most part, people were not assholes. They they lived together for a short time in this temporary community and did whatever they wanted to. This Burning Man, like many things, they, they change over time. Burning Man is still a great event in a lot of ways, but it's really a product now. It's no it's no longer an anarchist event. It hasn't been in a long time. One of the things that it's very effective at now is a giant event that 70,000 people go to that generates 25 million and more uh, dollars every year. Uh, one of the things it's very effective at is the vacation of choice for the large corporations in the Bay Area. So these guys work, these kids work, you know, 100 hours a week. They live in uh, their little Google complexes or they, they're there almost all the time. They make a lot of money, uh, but they're inculcated into this uh, into this mindset, this corporate mindset. And in many ways, it's great. I mean, it's very comfortable, and they're paid well, and they can do whatever they want. But they're, you know, they're very much part of a corporate uh, uh, creation that they don't often even really understand. I, I think how how it really works, and just how completely they are part of this larger scheme. Um, so these companies of course, started coming to Burning Man uh, 10 years and more ago, and they have their corporate building exercises at Burning Man, and uh, they encourage their employees to go there. Because if you work 100 hours a week all year long, you really need to party hard for two weeks so you can go back and go to work again for another 340 days. So this event that I helped start, Burning Man, is a great event. It's a great product now. You get what you pay for. Uh, it's a wonderful party, but it's also, it's many things. It's also uh, a way for corporations in San Francisco Bay Area and now around the world to encourage their employees to, uh, to blow off a little bit of steam so they can go back to the, uh, to the internet salt mines. Uh, it's a spectacle too, quite a wonderful spectacle, an astonishing one. Um, and I also like to, look, I like to look at the architecture. Uh, architecture tells you a lot about things. Architecture tells you a lot about where things are going. <coughs> pretty, pretty impressive architecture at that event now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was enough. <laughs> so that's what I, that I like this quote quite a bit. Um, I've got a couple more slides. Really quickly, just want to go through some groups that cacophony uh, kind of uh, influenced that I like. Dark Passage, an urban exploration group out of New York and Detroit. This is a gift. This is a set piece. This is a gift that was constructed of mannequins made and put into the theater in an abandoned insane asylum in Massachusetts and left there for anyone who happened to stumble upon it in the future to try and figure out what it means. <laughs> so it was a gift. Uh, my friend, uh, our friend Brian Goggin, who's a wonderful artist in San Francisco, did the Defenestration Project, where he built uh, dozens and dozens of pieces of uh, convoluted uh, furniture, put them on his abandoned building, and we did a huge, a huge event in 1997 uh, to commemorate this artwork. Uh, that was a cacophony influence. Brides of March still happens every year. Uh, it's kind of self-explanatory, self I think. Um, Cycleside, Bike Rodeo. Uh, crit you know Critical Mass? Everybody's heard of Critical Mass? Cycleside did an event called Critical Masturbation, 
where they took their punk rock, fucked up punk rock bicycles and blocked the critical mass to keep the bicycles from going through. And some of the bicyclists got the joke, others were yelling at them, we're trying to get through here, let us through. Don't block our way, the same way the people in automobiles would yell at them. We're trying to get through here, don't block our way. So critical masturbation was one of my favorite pranks ever. Because if you can't laugh at yourself, you shouldn't be a prankster. Uh, Cycleside builds bike rodeo, uh, bike rides made out of junk bicycles. They also do Viking burials at sea for important figures. This is Hunter Thompson when he died. We put him on a boat and burned him in a Viking burial at sea to commemorate his life, cycle side. Uh, some groups that came later, uh, anyway, these are some groups that are going on now, Wanderlust Project, uh, uh, Jeff Stark in New York City, urban exploration groups. It's all about playing. I mean, playing is a radical idea if you live in a society. Uh, it was a radical idea, and I still think it's an important part of a, of a healthy life. Um, you know, there's uh, Improv Everywhere, which is a much larger group, but they do uh, the memes, uh, you know, they play, on, they play on the streets with a lot of people. And I kind of like what they do. Stuff like this, I think, uh, maybe it's important, maybe it's not. It's fun. Um, and a pillow fight to put you to sleep. That's it. Thank you very much.